Here's how to paint a kingfisher in watercolour. I'll be using a few colours for this and basically make sure you wet the whole paper around the kingfisher and the branch it's perched on first. Really wet it because the background's got to be very wet in wet and loose so it looks out of focus. You can always tell how wet it is. You want it glossy but not puddled. Move your head to the side and you can see the light, the way the light's hitting it. You want it really reflective. So the colours I'm using are Cerulean Blue, Ultramarine, Payne's Grey, Cadmium Red, Cadmium Yellow and Burnt Sienna. Now the background is a mixture of Ultramarine, Payne's Grey, Burnt Sienna and Cadmium Yellow. Drop the colours in, mix them together give it a really mottled loose background because this could be water or it could be water and distant foliage. Make sure all the areas are covered and if you're working on a slope allow for the fact that it will run downwards. Now this is quite a cold blue grey I'm using so I want to warm it up a little bit as well so I'll add a little bit more ultramarine and then I'll be adding some yellows and browns as well. You want to make sure that it's more concentrated around the bird because the bird is in, in some respects lighter than the background and in other areas darker than the background but you want it to be butted up right close to the drawing otherwise it looks wrong with patchy gaps. I'm adding a bit more burnt sienna in there to warm things up a little bit and you can see I'm being really loose because the paper is so wet and the paint is so wet it's spreading as I add the paint. A little bit of cadmium yellow in there to add some greens And you want to do it while it's all wet. If your painting starts to dry, you're better off actually stopping, letting it dry and then adding more water on top. If you don't, you'll get really weird cauliflowers and usually in places that you don't want. I'm adding a bit more blue, a mixture of ultramarine and cerulean for where the water's going to be, just to give a very rough, loose indication. And matching it with a little bit of sky at the top. I'm going with a sludgy green now with a bit of cad yellow, ultramarine and a tiny bit of burnt sienna in that mix. Really trying to just give a very random background. Try not to overthink it because the more random you try to be the less random it will look. You want to let that dry for a short amount of time and it depends what you want to do with that background. If you're happy with it as it is, then just let it dry naturally. If you use a hairdryer, it won't work. But what I like to do and what I'm doing here is as it starts to dry, so when it goes from a gloss to a satin, I'm using an old toothbrush in water and I'm spattering the water onto the almost dry paint. And can you see it gives that lovely spattered mottled effect, a bit like, I don't know, it could be water droplets, it could be snowflakes, it could be anything, or just the glistening of light on the water. It's good when, to, when you've got a background that you don't know what to do with if it's a large expanse. Just spattering with water gives it that little bit of extra depth. So basically you're creating miniature cauliflowers on purpose, but you have to wait until the paper is satin dry. If it's glossy and you add the water, there's me just wafting the paper. I don't know why I'm doing that when I've got a hairdryer, but you know, never mind. Spattering a little bit more. If it's too wet, you see, and you add the water, it just fills in and just makes it more wet and wet. If it's too dry, nothing at all will happen. You can use rock salt or dishwasher salt at the same point, but I'm not a big fan because you end up with the salt on the painting until that salt has absorbed it and everything is dry. You can't brush the salt off while it's wet because it won't work. It won't give you the same effect at all. So once I've spattered everywhere, I'm not gonna do any more to that. So I'm gonna use the hairdryer 
just to dry it off. I'm now going in with a 50-50 mix of cadmium red and cadmium yellow to make a vibrant orange. If you've got a wide palette, you could use cadmium orange because that's how it's made. And this is just for the flashes of orange on the Kingfisher's body. So I am looking closely at a reference image, but uh, any, any reference of a Kingfisher will work well for this. And this is just a basic wash. You'll notice I'm using a number four round wash brush now. I've uh, ditched the large pointed wash brush, which was a pro arty squirrel. Uh, it holds so much water. I could do the whole painting in this, but it's it's okay to switch brushes where you want a little bit more finesse, because I have been known to be a bit slapdash and get carried away. There are several ways you can work with feathers. You can let them dry between each layer, which gives a more precise effect. Or if you're after something more loose and free, you can go in while it's slightly damp with the same color again, um, or slightly darker with short strokes to give you a, a mottled distant effect. So it just depends if you want a really close up detail version. So you do wet on dry, or if you want slightly soft focus, you can do wet on damp not wet because it will spread too far and in the case of this kingfisher I want the orange to dry before I put any of the blue on because otherwise the orange and the blue will spread and you'll get a horrible brown and kingfishers are known for their electric vibrant colors so we want it to dry and sometimes it's best to be patient with something like that but now the background is fully dry you can really see the effect of that spattering with water and how lovely and beautiful and random it actually is so I've mixed a slightly darker orange with a little bit more red and a hint of burnt sienna just to do short strokes I've switched to a pro arty miniature painting brush size one really good to hold these brushes and I'm doing short strokes following the contours of the feathers really short strokes keep building the short strokes up but look at your reference image to make sure that the strokes are going in the right direction if you think of the face any animal face as a clock face and their nose or beak is the center and then the feathers tend to radiate upwards at 12 o'clock and they radiate to the right at three o'clock and downwards at six and to the left at six at nine o'clock so um, just a good way of trying to remember how fur and feathers grow but I did a little bit more burnt sienna and a touch of Payne's grey just to get some really dark areas underneath the fold of the wing. Keep building the layers up, that's what's really important here. I've darkened the outline a little bit. I don't want it to look like an outline, but I do want him to be darker to bring himself forward from that lovely spattery background. And again, I'm letting it dry quite naturally here. Sometimes the hairdryer can dry things too quickly. And the other problem with the hairdryer 
especially if you've got other areas that you want to fill in. If it heats the paper up, to, which it will do to dry the colour, the rest of the paper is warm, so it means that when you start adding other colours, it dries too quickly. So I'm going back to my orange to do it, the hint of his little foot over that, uh, over that branch. So sometimes hair dryers aren't always an advantage and it's best to let it dry naturally. Um, I've done it a few times where I've dried the paper and when I've put another wash on in another area it's dried far quicker than it normally would just by air because the paper is hot so it's drying the paper from inside and outside so that's sometimes best to avoid. I was really pleased with how that background turned out. Um, it just makes it really interesting for the viewer to look at. Yes, you've got a nice, hopefully, kingfisher on a branch, um, but a background that's usually just bland and out of focus, it looks more interesting. Um, and it saves you having to try and give nondescript bushes, trees, plants, and all that kind of thing. It's well worth having a practice with the spattering technique. It won't always work, as I say, it's got to be damp, almost dry. So you look, you know, we said when you put your wash on, it's glossy. It will go to a satin finish and it, it's not long before that satin goes to a matte. And when it's matte, it's far too dry. So that satin is the right time to pounce with your old toothbrush or any stiff bristle brush and spatter with water. Remember to hold the brush down and stroke upwards with your thumb. Otherwise, you'll end up spattering your face and not the paper. I know from experience, which is why I'm reminding you. I like to keep a fairly limited palette, you see, of about five or six colours at all times. I'm just using cerulean blue. I did drop a tiny weeny bit of cadmium yellow in but only a pinhead so it doesn't really show. Just makes the blue a little bit more turquoise, iridescent, I don't know. It just gives it a certain glow. Depending on the brand of cerulean that is, you could use thalo blue with a lot of water if you want a really electric blue. Um, or just neat cerulean it, it honestly the brands vary massively and some ceruleans are quite chalky and pale others are really quite vibrant and that goes across all brands and all media so it's well worth it to try out different brands just to see what you think so i'm going in with my number four round now and uh, this will be for the bright blue on his head and back. Again, use your reference image to see exactly where these colours are. Now, the beak is going to reflect the sky and the water as well, as is the light in his eye. So I don't want that to be on straight white paper, because even if I'm lifting out, it will still show up. So his eye looks a little bit weird at the moment because it is blue, as is the top of his beak. But don't worry, in watercolours we always layer up and we start from the lightest colour and gradually get dark. Now because I don't want the white to be the lightest colour in the eye or the beak because of the reference image showing the reflections, I've gone with a bit of a cerulean blue wash. I could have used a bigger brush for this but I honestly... I do get a bit slap happy with it and um, if I'm using a bigger brush I go over the lines. So I'm adding a little bit of the orange um, within the cerulean. So the orange I've already used for his chest and markings. A little bit of that in there. I've just spilt a little bit onto the uh, background so you can see I've just used a, a clean damp brush to lift that off. And that needs to dry. I'm switching to a slightly finer brush now and uh, the turquoise has gone darker by the um, addition of orange. 
you could just use a little bit of cad yellow and if you wanted to expand the, the color palette you could use yellow ochre yellow ochre and cerulean make wonderful teals and turquoises by varying the amount of color and the amount of each color or water so again i'm just referring to the reference image to see how it looks and where the darker parts are to start modeling and molding the shape short strokes this is the number one miniature painting brush I just like the way it feels and it gives a really good point I've, I've had some of these brushes for years before they start splitting and that's generally down to my own um, ways of abusing the brush rather than the brush if I haven't cleaned it properly or something they sometimes split so really short strokes to create the feather patterns and keep referring to the reference. The thing is, if you haven't got a reference and you're trying to make it up, it will never actually look quite right. And be careful as well, not to ask AI to reproduce what a kingfisher looks like because it will try all of the kingfishers in the world and merge them into one. If it's a specific country of kingfisher, it will have a specific look. Now, I believe kingfishers are related to the kookaburra family, which is why they look quite similar. Um, I think the kookaburra is quite a bit bigger than the kingfisher. so we keep building up do everything in that one layer while you've got the color and then you can move on while that's drying you can mix up another color slightly darker and do that layer as well it's just easier it, it's quite fiddly if, if you try to do darks to lights because watercolors don't work that way and then you end up having to use gouache white gouache and then it starts looking chalky and opaque you lose the lovely glow that you get with watercolors so you can see I'm building up all the time. I haven't got loads of paint on that brush, but the miniature painting brushes don't hold a lot of paint. But that's quite good because it means you can get some really nice detailed lines. This brand actually go down to 10-0. Really quite pale, to be honest. Um, really quite thin, two or three hairs, and uh, perfect for miniature painting. I've added uh, more ultramarine to this mix. A little bit more cerulean blue and a tiny weeny bit of Payne's grey just to do some slightly darker royal blue markings on him. So yeah, I think it goes a size 2 is the, the biggest of these miniature painting brushes down to a 10-0. And then they do a small 1 8th of an inch flat brush in this series. And I love them all. I use them a lot for painting in general, but for animals and birds it's brilliant it really does work well um, I'm back to my number four round where I want to cover a slightly larger area with this color and I mix it with that as well if I mixed with the big wash brush it, it holds so much water the colors um, I, they get sloppy and uh, it can dilute the pigment too much especially on a small area if I was working on a larger area then of course I'd use the larger brush to mix with and again, referring to the reference image, I can see where the lighter spots are and I don't want to paint over them because then there was no point in putting the underpainting in in the first place. So the plan is to gradually get darker and darker. And we'll let that dry naturally and I'm mixing up a little bit more now because that's dried and watercolors are transparent you can actually put the same color on top and you'll get a slightly darker layer if you think of a half pan or a full pan of watercolor that's just basically like a million layers all sandwiched together so whatever color that pan is that's the darkest you can get it so if you keep diluting your paint and building up the layers it will eventually get that dark so I'm adding more details every single time. I'm looking at the reference image to see where the darks are. But I don't want to go dark too quickly. If I go too dark, you know, it's really hard to get that off. And um, you start lifting the colour off and then you might start lifting through too many layers. And then you've got white paper and you've wasted a lot of time. So be patient and build the layers up. This was filmed during a two hour class, or nearly two and a half hours. So it's been edited and sped up slightly 
to fit in within half an hour of viewing. But I've done it so you can still see everything that's going on and uh, you can pause it if you need to. But obviously I wouldn't recommend you trying to paint with this level of detail in half an hour unless your hand is like the speed of a sewing machine needle which it looks like mine is on here but don't forget it's sped up by one and a half times normal speed. So this darker bluey yeah royal blue navy blue it gives a really good effect for the darker feathers and again constantly refer to that reference image that what it that's what it's there for if you want something to look like something you need a reference image so just keep adding the darker tones and you'll see here that I'll be zooming in in a second so you can see it's slightly easier and um, adding the Payne's Grey. Now I'm not using the Payne's Grey very neat for this. Um, it's slightly diluted and it will dry 20% lighter. So this is my tentatively adding the darks in with the Payne's Grey and using the miniature painting brush and really examining the reference image constantly to get those darker shades in and it really does work well build it up slowly because there are certain darker markings on its head I don't want it too dark because the the, the dark Payne's grey can really take over and just be too much and we don't want that do we so keep referring to the reference and you can see actually because these are short strokes the, the brush is actually holding quite a bit of color before I have to go and recharge it It still looks a little bit weird because I haven't touched his eye and his beak and they're still pale cerulean blue but it will all come together with watercolour because you're building up layers you really have to trust the process to make sure it builds up slowly otherwise it'll go a bit odd and by doing it this way you might find that you have to do two or three layers of Payne's Grey to get the colour you want but it's worth it because it will give you more depth whereas if you just shove on a really dark color it it won't look as real or as solid it just it just looks too clumpy so slowly build up these darker areas again short strokes to follow the direction of the feathers constantly refer to your reference image it is really important I can't stress that enough and I know I've said that a lot during this video but it really is crucial So now I've zoomed out again, you can see where I've started using more of the Payne's Grey mix. There's still a little bit of blue in there for the darker areas of the body and the back and the wings. And you can isolate some of the feather shapes a little bit, but you don't want to outline everything too heavily because it'll just look like you've outlined everything too heavily. And to be honest, if you were going to do that, you could just do it with a, a liner pen and then it would be a watercolour with pen. But uh, this way, it, it just keeps it quite subtle and you want the Kingfisher to come forward from its background. So keep building up and referring to the image you're copying from. The wings are quite an unusual shape, they're not long and pointy as you imagine. You can see there that um, I'm trying to outline but uh, I don't want to do too much. So moving on to the beak, I've got a slightly more washy version of that uh, blue-grey to try and build up the mid-tones and then as it dries I start going in darker. And the flashes of white that you can see around his neck, like his bib and uh, around the side, 
you want to leave that you could put some very dilute gray strokes in there that are hardly visible and it just looks like you haven't left it on purpose and there's so many different layers of speckles of feathers on the kingfisher it really is a beautiful bird to to behold and they're so fast So really you want the colours, especially for the beak, to dry a little bit before you go too far. Um, because if you go back in, it starts to look odd um, and it might cauliflower and I don't want a beaky cauliflower. So I'm going back in now it's dry with much darker, intense paints grey. And it's quite tricky in watercolour or any paint really where you want the, the strength of colour but you also need it dilute to flow. So you need a lot of paint. Uh, you might find using a tube works better because you've automatically got the large amount of pigment there. And I've diluted it a little bit just to blend some of those together to get some more midtones. And no, you can't really see the blue that was there, um, only in little spaces, and that's what it's about. Working with the eye will be exactly the same. The blue is just the reflective part of the eye, which there won't be a lot of. The rest of it is going to be Payne's Grey. So I'm doing its eyelid leaving a slight gap because the eyelid area is usually a little bit paler and then going in with the colour. And now this is neat to paint grey. Uh, there's a fine line between wanting a reflection and not it letting it overtake the reflection. But this number one uh, detail brush is phenomenal. Sometimes I'll go down to a zero if I really need the, uh, the finer lines. But it's that triangular handle, you see. So easy to, um, to work with. It just sits naturally as you hold it. Whereas some detail brushes, <coughs> the ferrule and the actual brush that you hold is really thin because the bristles are thin. And, and that does mean that sometimes if your grip's not great, it can be quite hard to hold and maintain a comfortable grip for long periods of painting. So you can see there how that pale cerulean blue wash initially in the eye works really, really well for the highlight. <clears throat> so we're almost done now with the Kingfisher. Just a few more tweaks and then it will be back onto the branch that it's sitting on. But I want that to be quite loose. So I've mixed together a bit of Burnt Sienna, a bit of Payne's Grey and a little bit of Cadmium Yellow because I wanted a dirty, browny, greeny, grey colour. And I'm using the number four round um, only because I want more control of where I'm putting it. I don't want to go over the bird. A bigger brush would be more sensible but I can paint quite quickly um, so I'm, I'm not so worried. But if you do struggle with paint drying um, once you've done the, the fiddly areas, go in with a bigger brush. I'm adding a bit more Payne's Grey while it's wet on the underside of the branch. And if you can see there, I'm curving upwards so it gives it that knobbly branch look. I'm adding a bit more Cadmium Yellow diluted on there to try and well it'll look a bit mossy but also I'm hoping to try and create cauliflowers on purpose in some places it doesn't always work cauliflowers are notorious they always happen when you don't want them and when you try to make them happen they won't work but if it doesn't I've got a bit of a mossy branch and that's fine so then I'm going back in to this section because I wanted everything done while it was damp you see so I didn't want to do the whole branch at any one time so I'm going in with the Burnt Sienna, Payne's Grey and uh, Cadmium Yellow mix. If you haven't got Payne's Grey add Ultramarine and either Lamp or Mars Black whichever you've got. And again more Payne's Grey for the underside in a, in a curved motion to get that knobbly shading. So I'm doing a couple of inches of branch at a time and then the additional Cadmium Yellow mix 
Cadmium Yellow and Ultramarine to get that mossy colour, but it's quite a yellowy moss. You could always lift out the highlights if you needed to. But I'm quite happy with how that's looking as it dries. So keep moving along the branch. I've started using the uh, brown again because as I said, you want it while each layer is wet. Build it up slowly. But don't let it dry because you want the softness of the shading and the moss. And there we have the finished piece. Good luck if you try it and I look forward to seeing what you create.